All right, so today we're going to explore chapter four of the mother book. Uh, it's an unusual chapter in that it has a different um, focus than the previous three, which are very much focusing on how to um, align ourselves with the transformative force, the force of grace, and the acts of, of uh, required on our part to move into alignment with that force and allow it to do its work. And this actually continues in chapter 5 and actually comes to its, I feel, its completion. But for whatever reason, the editors threw in this chapter 4. So <clears throat> maybe it's, they thought it was too intense. <laughs> but in fact, this conversation is in itself quite intense. And the conversation of this chapter is about money. Money and it as a, you know, as a force in the creation and that it has a role, a power associated with the vital and physical planes that are essential to the opportunity of human life. So <clears throat> before I go into, we go into reading the, the mother book, I thought I would talk about money a bit. So money is simply, it can be <clears throat> positive, it can be negative, it can be neutral. It can be tamasic, it can be rajasic, and it can be sattvic in our relationship with it. So money in itself is just, it's just a commodity. It's just an instrument. It's just a means of exchange and it's an asset. It is something that we can accumulate through our savings and we can uh, inherit money or gain the value that money represents in multiple ways, often through our own labor. <coughs> and that this, uh, our relationship with money is actually even more intense. It is more interwoven in the fabric of our lives than it was even at the time of Sri Aurobindo's revelation of the mother book. It is a measure. Everything now is measured quantitatively by this money value, this money principle. How much does it cost? How much do we get? What is the benefit cost ratio? Basically, all of this is because the ego has taken this commodity this unit of exchange, and is using it for its own purposes. It has a role to play, and there is a correct relationship with money that isn't about abundance or scarcity. It isn't about a power that money itself has. The only power money has is the agreement that's behind it. Right now, even paper money, the time Shirobindo was writing this, it was all paper or coin. Now the money is up in the ether. It's in the internet. Our credit card is an access not only to our assets, but also to our debt. So money has become mm, as if outside of the order of the normal karmic world, or so it seems. <laughs> that means you can spend as if you had an unlimited fortune. And all you do is what exceeds what you have to spend goes into debt. So we have assets, and we have liabilities, and the world that we live in now is that this exchange of money is really a principle that we, some people just don't even pay attention to. <laughs> they just ring up one credit card until they can't get any more on that and they get another credit card and ring up the next credit card until they can't get any more on that and they don't pay attention to the fact that the right balance with money is proportional. <clears throat> to find the right balance basically comes right down to at a very fundamental level of cause and effect is not to spend more than you make. Duh. Right? 
So you, you can't eat more food than you have. So unfortunately with money, you can actually spend more money than you have. <clears throat> so the error is we're not tracking consequences. Or, depending upon your nature, you are tracking the consequences <clears throat> and you're using that to reinforce your security, your sense of well-being, your freedom, your independence, you see? But that's not money. It's what we're assigning to what money can do for us. And as long as money becomes the value that we empower, then someone who has a lot of money becomes important. And somebody who doesn't have a lot of money becomes unimportant. And if we don't have a lot of money, we're unimportant. And if we have a lot of money, we are important. It's a false structure that just adds one more layer to this multi multiple layer of maya that entangles us all. So what you could look at, if anything, is coming to the proper relationship with this principle we call money. What is the proper relationship with it? Ideally, it would be sattvic. Not tamasic, not rajasic. What does tamas do with money? Hoards it. Seeks to possess it. He uses it to feel more aggregated, more, more real, more, more significant. This aggregation of money. And then there is rajas, which simply freely spends the money to empower its ability to impact the world, to feel free, to not be bound, to fulfill its desires, to control other people, to manipulate, <clears throat> or to simply fulfill the whim, the impulse, the shopping addiction in which our culture feeds through our consumerism. You know, when they wrote the Constitution, <clears throat> that one of our rights is the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Little did they know that that would create unlimited credit cards and unlimited debt <laughs> so that we could continue to seek happiness. And of course we know about Gita's happiness, right? <clears throat> so there is the happiness of the Thomas happy, the Sattvic happiness, which is pain at the beginning, nectar at the end. This would be saving money. This would be using money wisely. This would be restraining the impulses to spend it unnecessarily. It would be to use the money for the highest or most necessary purposes that are arising. <clears throat> if it's rajas, then the money is being used as a tool of your ego, a tool of self-expression, a tool of, of uh, action, to do, to shop, to be, to play, to have, to acquire, to gain significance and importance to secure your freedom, to secure your independence. And then what is the nature of rajas? <laughs> it's happiness at the beginning, poison at the end. So if we spend all our money, eventually those credit cards pile up and we can no longer get credit cards. And what we have is this endless hounding that'll come. Give me, give me, give me back my money from all the people who are making money off of money. That's one of the great distortions of money, is people are using money to make money. What it was originally, it was an, it was an exchange of energy. If you had fruit that you grew in your garden, you took the effort to create that fruit and you exchanged it with someone who had a chicken that they cared for and nurtured into adulthood. So it was an exchange of energy. I expend energy in this way, and you give me in exchange that energy for something that I can't do because I'm focused in this way. And this division of labor came in the process of mankind learning to work together, to collaborate, and money became the coin, the emblem, the symbol of that energy unit. It became an energy unit. So that if you had the coins that represented this effort, Instead of you doing the work or 
you having had already done the work, you can take that accumulated energy and trade it for something all at once. So it's an exchange of energy is what money represents. Someone who then <coughs> labors in one area accumulates credit. Someone who labors in another area accumulates credit and they can work, they can exchange between them this credit to get something that they otherwise would not have available to them. So in the basic principle of money, it was we were creating something of value. It represented the value we created through our effort. <clears throat> so when we create something through our effort, we reap the fruits of that as long as there is a quality of sacrifice in that efforting. And if we are vested in that efforting, either in the acquiring of money or the spending of money, then we accumulate karma associated with that, consequences with that. So the nature of money is karma. It creates consequences and it veils us. So if we have a disproportional amount of money in credit available to us and we use all that up until it becomes a debit, then actually that debit is karma. It obligates you. It links you into the world. And if you don't pay off that debit, then your ability to create more credit is reduced. So money is actually a measure. It's a measure of energy. Our wise use of that money, our solid use of that money, is a, able to perceive its relative value, not giving it undue importance, but rather living life based on the value that life brings, or the necessities that arise in the course of life. So if you have, a, if you have an accident and you go to the hospital, then money would be one way to cover the cost of the accident. Or if you have an, a car breakdown, if you had money, then the money can be used to cover what would otherwise be a debt of the car breaking down. So this ability to use money cleanly, to be able to restrain the tendencies of us to um, dis either uh, bypass the consequences of money, or to use it unwi unwisely for the gain of the ego, <clears throat> or to um, use it to manipulate other people in order for you to have power or influence or control or acquisitions for enhancing your ego. So what has happened now is everything of value almost everything of value, has a monetary component. Even spirituality has a monetary component. Because in this world of mon mon moneyization or monetaryization, <coughs> everything costs. You can't, you can't buy clothing without money. You can't have a place for people to meet without money. You can't do anything without money. So in the West this is much more rigid, but it's becoming rigid worldwide. The entire world is taken over by the money force. The nature of the money force in its, in its um, influence on human beings is it's a means of enhancing the ego. It becomes a means of enhancing or diminishing the ego. It becomes a power in itself because of the agreement. Because we all agree that a dollar is worth a dollar and a hundred dollars is worth a hundred dollars. You get a little piece of paper that says a hundred dollars on it. Then that's the value and you hand it to someone and I'll give you one hundred ones or ten dens or whatever in exchange. It's agreed upon unit of exchange of energy. If some, if the collective consciousness stopped believing in money, which does happen, you know, during when that, there's a run on the banks, 
or when the market collapses. This bubble of accumulation of wealth, far beyond the possibility of an individual to spend for the necessities of their life, is a distortion, and this distortion comes from the rajas, the assured principle of rajas. There is a demonic principle associated with money too, oppression, control. <clears throat> it sets it up so it lends money to people, so they become indebted. And then when someone's indebted to you, you have control over them. So there is this structure that's going on in the entire society that is the worst of the worst, but we don't notice it because it's the agreement and everybody's doing it. So instead of stealing your children or stealing your cars or confiscating your houses, <coughs> it's in this whole ether world in the exchange of this commodity. This assigning of value and the agreement of assigning the value is what makes something without value valuable. This is ego. Okay, that said, recognize that this is so, that this is the agreement, and it isn't truth. It isn't a reflection of the reality. As a matter of fact, the people in the Western world do not live in reality because money is so available. Even the poor of us, of us in, the, in the Western world is richer than the middle class or the rich in the other parts of the world. We have unheard of wealth. Even kings and queens of previous ages never had as much access to wealth as any one of us do. Just by acquiring debt. So we live in this imaginary construct that's not looking at the consequences. And if this has an essential falsehood, all that falsehood, when it gets big enough, all it has to do is break, the agreement breaks. Somebody goes to the bank and so they say, sorry, we're closed, we're no longer giving people money. And you say, well, what about my $20,000? Sorry, we're no longer giving people money. Then the whole agreement gets punctured. And this is the bubble that we live in. And this is why the whole world is trying to keep going this illusion, trying to keep it going. There's such a thing as billionaires. Unimaginable quantities of money where if the individual spent 24 hours for the next thousand years, they couldn't spend it all. If there wasn't means by which to spend it. And what it does is it creates exaggerated value where one person in one culture can't buy an apple because of the price that's become common in another culture. So there's an inherent untruth in this. And when it comes to the spiritual path and what we're talking about in this fourth chapter is the manifesting force. Up to now is preparing ourselves and actually in the fifth chapter, it completes it. In the fourth chapter, they're talking about how to convert money from the assured principle and the demonic principle that's associated with it into something that serves the divine manifestation. Mobilizing the money power to manifest divine. And not many people can do this unless there are those who, due to karma, they have a larger quantity of money available to them, and they can have an influence with that power depending upon their nature and the priorities that they set. Therefore, the money power that they have, the assets and the commodities of exchange available to them, can become a means of manifesting divine into the world, into the physical and vital world. And this is what the mother was pointing to. There's another principle that isn't directly addressed in the fourth chapter, and that is this principle of money that comes from karma and money that comes from kubera, 
So one is money that comes from the principle of Lakshmi, the goddess that gives benefits. We are all born into this life with a certain quantum of Lakshmi principle, the karmic principle, where we have more perhaps abundance than someone else. And this is usually because of past effort or sacrifice that we have not spent. We haven't used up our account in the accumulation of karmas. So that we come into this life, money is readily or easily available. And there are those, of course, who are born into the lives with a deficit in the domain of karma, which Lakshmi governs. And therefore, you're born and no matter what you do, you can't seem to make enough money. There's always this lack of money, scarcity of money. So this is the karmic world, and the karmic world is ruled by Lakshmi. And that's why in India they keep doing offerings to Lakshmi, oh Lakshmi, oh Lakshmi, please, please give me the money, please give me the benefit, please have this happen for my children. And Lakshmi is willing to do it, but it's a debit. It's a debit. And you will have to pay for it in one way or another, either in this life or in other lives. So it's not wise to ask Lakshmi to do it for us, when really what's required is our own energy to gain the credit, our own sacrifice, our own effort. That's why people who earn money through their own effort have the cleanest karma associated with money. If money has come easy, it just depends how that money was created. And it brings with it, to the person who has it, something of the karma that created it. So the person who has it, or has inherited, inherited, carries something of the Shurik principle that was there that created the wealth that you were born into. Then the opportunity is to use that money wisely, to actually give it away to make the sacrifice. It doesn't have to all be given away, but some proportional gives away, giving it away for some higher purpose or cause cleans the ancestral karma, the energy and the value that was given to it, to some extent. It can also be a bypass. The guilty conscience of one who ripped off a lot of people, made a lot of money, who was a shurik and and or demonic and grain power and influence because of that. So there's a distortion that comes to the child that inherits that money or the children that inherit that money. And this has to be purified in some fashion. Otherwise, the child will become overtaken by the, care, the burden of that money. Either by be, uh, becoming an unwitting instrument of it or by purifying it, becoming a channel of it into the manifestation of something true, saltwick, or divine in the world. So these, this is just another arena for our karma, cause and effect. And this balance is being kept continuously by the gods. That's why the Gita says, sacrifice to God. Once you've sacrificed the sacrifice to the gods, then you can reap the fruits of your effort. But if it was given to you without any effort on your part, you're carrying with the burden of the sin that created that money. So then it has to be given, used for higher purposes, in order to purify the system. And then there's another principle beyond karma, beyond Lakshmi. And in, in the Vedic tradition it's called Kubera. Kubera is the god that rules the distribution of wealth and power and influence to those who are serving the divine purpose. It brings benefit that has nothing to do with the karma, good or bad, that the being brought with their body, but who through that being, their manif that being is manifesting divine, Kubera brings all that it needs. Matter of fact, more than it needs so that it can manifest that divinity, expand, convert this money power into something that serves for the divine glory, the divine manifestation. So Kapera then brings money far in excess of what one would inherit or could accumulate through their own effort. 
and it's pure because it comes to the principle of advakshina or devotion it evokes this call to give the manifestation principle so when any one person gives a donation they're, they're actually channels for the Kabera force and there is a sense of energy of bliss and power and goodness that comes when you take that action that is Kubera. That's the principle that Kubera represents manifesting through you. When one serves the divine manifestation, one's own capacity to manifest divine is expanded and increased. So one who gives freely from that place for the divine manifestation is blessed they become graced by the Kubera force. And then this power of the money that's given in that principle to bring truth and love and harmony and order into the world is greater than any other kind of money possibly brought. So for example, with New Dharma, the nature of New Dharma, which is so interesting, is when we became a non-profit, it's written into the law that New Dharma cannot make more money after a certain point than it receives from donations. If it makes more money than it receives in donations, it's no longer considered a nonprofit. The ratio between what New Dharma makes as an organization in programs or businesses or whatever else versus what is given in donations needs to have a certain ratio or else you lose your nonprofit status. No. All right. Just we, the, not, yeah, don't we go don't have here. to go into that in exact detail. <laughs> but the principle is that the Kibera force then is able to manifest to the activities of the organization in a way that um, can manifest the divine principle into existence. So, this is what I saw when I met my teacher. When I met my teacher, I had accumulated some wealth. I had sold assets and, and done, done things so that what wealth I had, I brought with me to India. And when I was there, first at first, it was a strategy and I was warned, <laughs> don't give your money to the guru. <laughs> People said, don't give the money to the guru. But as soon as I got into the sphere of that, all I wanted to do was give my money to the guru. And I gave my, all my money to my guru. And I felt great. And I had no money. And I felt free. And then he arranged for me to have money. Yeah, you know, Satchamayi for some money and me. Put some money in from one of his devotees and I had a little money. And that was enough to serve me. And I was so free of money. It was so wonderful. I had no debt. I had no obligation. I didn't have all the compensating motives when you're working for money because when you work for money you take that money and you enjoy yourself so that you can make up for all, all the sacrifice you have to do while you're working. <clears throat> and then when I, all that was gone and I came back to the United States I assembled some more money from other sources. <laughs> came back to India determined to hold on to it. <laughs> and then I gave that away too. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help myself. And I was probably purifying my karmas and the consequences so that I could be free of the money taint. So this is what this chapter is speaking of. It's speaking of one who's come to the place where the having or not having money is no longer a defining principle for their lives. When one is like that, then they are capable of serving the divine manifestation, of giving value, converting the spiritual value into a material value, that it can serve and be available to more and more people. Okay, so let's begin reading the mother. Chapter four. Money is the visible sign of a universal force, and this force in its manifestation on earth works on the vital and physical planes and is indispensable to the fullness of the outer life. 
In its origin and its true action, it belongs to the divine. But like other powers of the divine, it is delegated here and in the ignorance of the lower nature can be usurped for the uses of the ego or held by a shirk influences and perverted to their purpose. So what is the divine principle that money represents? Value, meaning, importance. That's a divine principle. What makes something meaningful or valuable is its inherent divine nature. That's divine. Beauty. Beauty is not monetized. I mean, beauty is not monetized, but we can all experience beauty without paying for it. We can all experience value. We can be uplifted, inspired. These are divine expressions of this capacity to create value. All value is a reflection of the divine glory that's hidden in the veil of this creation. So, the ability of money to create value, what the value that money creates is one essential to the original purpose of the creation, which is to expand the manifestation of the sought into existence, the inherent potentiality that the sought carried into the possibilities of existence. So, the power of money is to bring forward a possibility that hasn't been able to manifest yet, and to manifest it. So that power of possibility money carries because of the assignment of value to the money. We're all working. If, it, if we lived in a world where you were paid to be, not paid to work, then each of us would begin to in, be, move into a relationship with each other that had to do with value. Let me give you this that I have in value in exchange for what you have that I deem valuable. So this principle of value is a natural alignment between what's available to us, the resources available, the talents available, the skills available to us, and our interaction in the creation. Someone who's a doctor has a value different than someone who's a car mechanic. They carry within them an inherent potential value, which doesn't have anything to do with how much they're worth until you assign money to it. So the principle of value is what money represents. <clears throat> but we, give, we, we forget the energetic component that a skill or ability or a talent or a resource a person has and we make assign it to the money. I'm valuable because I have money. Not because I have any particular skills. Not because I'm a nice person. Not because I manifest something that enhances the world. But because I have money. There's the distortion. Held by a shirk, influences and perverted to their purpose. Then we unwittingly get born into this. And this is the agreement. So if you see something in the store and you say, oh, it's so pretty, mommy, can I have it? You can't have it because you, you don't have money. So the value can't be enjoyed. So it stops part of the delight of being in the physical, vital world. It becomes a, regular, a controlling influence. And this is taken over by these structures of power, control, domination. This is indeed one of the three forces, power, wealth, sex, that have the strongest attraction for the human ego and the Asura, and are most generally misheld and misused by those who retain them. The seekers or keepers of wealth are more often possessed rather than its possessor. Few escape entirely a certain distorting influence stamped on it by its long seizure and perversion by the Asura. Power, greed, sex. Three major distorting influences on what is true, on what is true and not true. 
what is valuable and not valuable. Our need for any of these three, our wanting of any of those three, distorts the truth of our relationship with existence. When you're not touched by these, like children aren't touched by these, then they are in existence in an immediacy. It's not qualified. It's a free dance where you don't need toys. You can play with sticks and stones or mud and grass and flowers. It is a complete... The value is not being defined by what other adults have been contaminated with. So this is the distortion that has come, that we were all born into, not recognizing its falsity, its, its bailing impact. And unwittingly, we give money value that has nothing to do with itself. And that quality in us that assigns that is our own piece of the collective exuric drives, the collective demonic drives that each of us carry as part of the ancestral karma. So that there was rich people and poor people. A distortion in the truth that we're all equal. There were people with powerful and people who are not powerful. A distortion of the principle that we all have equal validity, equal opportunity to manifest that quality of being that we all share. You see? And this is true in sex too. The whole principle of desiring or being wanting to be desired. Wanting to be, wanting to have or to avoid. These are all distorting influences. But this particular one with money, we're saying this is where our focus is because money has such capacity to do good. It could mobilize resources way beyond that could be what could be mobilized in previous times before money came into existence. You can put value into a machine and the machine can do something where 200, 300 men couldn't do. It can plow fields. It can mix concrete. It could dig out ores that are in the planet. It could smelt or steel. It could create new alloys. It could build, create electricity. It could do many, many things. So the power of money is also creative in the hands of the right person. And what would allow that to happen? Someone sees the value. That's why people invest in new business. They see the value, but what they're seeing is the value to make more money. They're not seeing the value of what's being produced. This is the veil. The veil that's in the culture now. We're not creating anything anymore. We're just accumulating. And this is the distortion, the perversion. And that's why the world is in suffering. These imbalances is what causes suffering. For this reason, most spiritual disciplines insist on a complete self-control, detachment and renunciation of all bondage to wealth and of all personal and egoistic desire for its possession. Some even put a ban on money and riches and proclaim poverty and bareness of life as the only spiritual condition. But this is an error. It leaves the power in the hands of the hostile forces to reconquer it for the divine to whom it belongs and use it divinely for the divine life is the supermental way for the sadhaka. So now he's talking about manifestation. The supermental way. What is the supermental way? It's creating a new order, a new possibility for being, for mankind. And it's looking to bring it into the physical world into the structures of mankind is organized. It's looking to create structures of being that haven't existed before that are not based on the falsehood of the distortion of the money power. So the claiming, reclaiming the money that is now being used by the assured forces for divine purposes, this is quite a task. In fact, what does it look like? You know, <clears throat> certainly the amount of wealth that's out there in the hands of the one percent way exceeds anything divine needs for manifesting the new possibility of of humanity. Far exceeds. 
Actually, governments are actually cleaner and truer instruments, even though everybody hates governments. Because they are serving, in principle, the people who they take the money from. But in finance, in economics, in development, the money power is not serving anything but the individuals who are manipulating it for their own end. So how will how is this conversion done? How is this ability to mobilize this distorted force be converted into something that can manifest divine? This is the question. And I am sure it is the question that Chara Bindo and the mother were dealing with on a frequent basis. And I believe this is one of the reasons he wrote this chapter was to speak to this mobilization of this money power for divine manifestation. I'm going to read both paragraphs. I think you can tie them together. You must neither turn with an aesthetic shrinking from the money power, the means it gives and the objects it brings, nor cherish a rajasic attachment to them or a spirit of enslaving self-indulgence in their gratifications. Regard well simply as a power to be won back for the mother and placed at her service. All wealth belongs to the divine, and those who hold it are trustees, not possessors. It is with them today. Tomorrow it may be elsewhere. All depends on the way they discharge their trust while it is with them, in what spirit, with what consciousness in their use of it, to what purpose. So how to accumulate money power? Make a lot of money and don't spend it. <laughs> Ted, what's his name, who um, married Jane Fonda? Ted Turner. Ted Turner. Ted Turner. He lived a, as a pauper. He drove an old car, if he had a car at all. And he made money and time. all he did was he made money to make money. He didn't spend it, not on himself. He did it to create more and more. Now, it's not a perfect example, but the idea is he accumulated money power. Mm-hmm. What's that? I think it's the wrong guy. I think of Walmart, Sam. No, no Ted, Turner. Ted Turner. Yeah, from the CNN. All right, what did he, which network yeah. did he start? Yeah, I think it's CNN. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's the you're thinking of Sam Walton, but yeah. he wasn't married to. So, and there are there are other people who have come to wealth and now are using their wealth to serve the world. So, the founder of Microsoft. So, and of course, his name is not here in my mind because my mind. Bill not Gates. Here. Bill Gates. <laughs> It's barely in her mind. Well, there's a great story about Carnegie who accumulated his wealth, but he always felt that the money was coming to him because of God's grace. So he went out and he took the money and started libraries. So there are Carnegie libraries all over the world, and he was considered a huge philanthropist. He could not give the money away fast enough. In fact, the more he gave it the way, away, the more he accumulated. And that's just like a principle. But he felt he was God's instrument and he was to give this money away to the world. And that's what he set out to do and he became wealthier for doing that. <laughs> it's like, that's crazy. But that's what um, Bill Gates and who's the... Melinda. Bill and Melinda, don't forget. Yes, yes Aunt Mel- yes. Actually, it was Melinda who started the foundation. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. But Bill wasn't going to get that Berkshire, lesson by himself. The, the Berkshire <laughs> Hathaway Warren guy, but Warren Buffett, Warren. yes. He's bringing, he brought in that principle, and he, it's why Bill Gates and Melissa and other people are doing this. So when someone is using the money power without self-interest, that means they've come to a place in their relationship with the world that this excess money is no longer affecting what they need in their day-to-day lives. And the standard of that is not about poverty. It's about just some equilibrium. No reason. The money power isn't about living in poverty. You can have all that that the world brings. That becomes then your base. And then from there you serve with whatever in excess of that. So it's not about how comfortable or how poor you live and your ability to mobilize the money power to serve the greater good, to bring forward the supermental manifestation. 
And I do believe that the philanthropists are being some, were being motivated by a higher principle than just atoning for their sins for making their money. <laughs> so that has to be recognized. So this ability to give uh, whatever it is that you do not immediately need is actually something any one of us can do. To utilize the portion of money power that's available to us to serve the divine manifestation. In the process then, this idea of being a trustee, how the attitude that you hold it with, the freedom from fear or clinging or need, this ability to give freely, these are all the measures that Sri uh, Aurobindo was pointing to as the means for converting the money power, one person at a time. Each of us in our own relationship to this money power. Can I read what she wrote about that? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I need your little thing. <laughs> so, somebody asked the question to the mother. Sri Aurobindo speaks of a weak bondage to the habits that the possession of riches creates. And she responds, this is about halfway through, um, it is a bondage, a weak attachment. He who is quite detached when he lives in the midst of all these things, it is well with him. When these things are gone, it is well also. He's totally indifferent to both. That is the right attitude. When it is there, he uses it or she uses it. When it is not, he does without it. And for his inner consciousness, this makes no difference. So this is pointing to a state of consciousness. The, the quality of the state of consciousness is equanimity. Coming to the place where you're free from desire or attachment or fear allows you to be in relationship with money as a power, using it in the way that you see could best serve the higher manifestation. So this, if money, ha if money is not coming, then the secret to, to being in the right relationship with that apparent scarcity is to not spend the money, not to spend any money, that, more money than you have. And if it's in abundance, it isn't to spend all the money that you have, you only spend what's needed. So this moving into a right, right relationship with the money power. Now I know it's, this is tough, because I know that I was born into a life where things were poor, initially, and there was obviously scarcity consciousness, and the family struggled in order to bring money in, and they saved and penny-pinched, and there was, you know, we had the same toys every Christmas. And so the nature of this was it created an orientation that money was scarce. And there became in me a desire to have money so I could have what I wanted. And I would, by hook or crook, try to find ways to make money so I could have what I wanted. So I took on the distortion of that apparent scarcity. And what I noticed about scarcity was I couldn't, uh, I didn't, couldn't be in integrity. I had to cheat, steal, lie in order to get the money because that was the only way I was going to get enough. So I, I would have food or I could get to the place to, I needed to get. It was whatever strategy it took. So in scarcity, it's very hard to have a conversation about this conversation because you're coming from a, a burden, a limitation that you inherited. And you carry, you carry the burden of this until you discover for yourself the right relationship. And the advantage that I had was I enjoyed working. I didn't hesitate to work. I was a good worker. So all I needed to do was find jobs and I had enough money. So it became a means. Now, maybe I remember one time my brother gave me a Volkswagen camper while he went to Vietnam. He bought it for me. And the engine, uh, one of the cylinders blew. I had no money. I barely had money for gas. So <clears throat> I drove the car with three cylinders. It was a four-cylinder car down the freeway at 35 miles an hour. <clears throat> Because I was trying to go to a job where the person said, you paint my house and I'll give you enough money, just enough money, so I could buy a new cylinder and fix the car. 
So I drove down the freeway driving 35 miles an hour, and I got pulled over by the cops and saying, you can't go this slow on the freeway. <laughs> and the car sounded tremendously loud. But he let me, I told him I was going to a job that was going to make me the money so I could fix the car, and he let me go. <laughs> and when I got the money, that's what I did. I went out and bought the parts, and I learned, how, I learned from scratch how to rebuild a Volkswagen engine. And that's how it was for years and years for me. It was very much. I remember going to uh, junior college. I had just gotten a son. We were on welfare. I didn't have enough money to buy coffee. I didn't have enough money to buy tea. So I drank hot water. And I got used to drinking hot water. That was all I had. And I graduated from junior college because everything I did had to go into supplies and, and, and tuition and the rest of it. And I didn't think of it. I just did the work that was required. And this began to purify the taint of the scarcity I was born into. This willingness to do the work needed, however difficult it was, to bring forward a higher possibility. This continued into college, into when I went to the University of Washington, where I literally didn't have a car. I'd take a two-hour bus ride to school and two-hour bus ride back. That's all I could afford. <clears throat> it wasn't until I found a job and I was going to school full-time and working full-time. And I graduated summa cum laude. I, was ha I had that capacity to work, to do whatever it took, to bring something into existence. That, I had that gift. And that allowed me to convert the money power into something that could serve, at least for me, a possibility of a better life with more opportunity, more opportunities for self-expression. I became an artist. I graduated in fine arts, and then I graduated as architecture, and so on and so forth. Life expanded out of that alignment, that capacity to do what's necessary. I didn't go into debt like most people do. I mean, I, I know people who have, have $170,000 of debt to get a foreign arts master's degree. $170,000 debt. Times have changed. Huh? Times, <laughs> Times have, have really changed. <laughs> I mean, it's first appalling that that would ever happen that would ever be allowed. Thank the banks. But that's basically what we've done unwittingly is we've closed down the possibilities of young people to create their lives by indebting them in this way. Being sucked into this, you know, credit debt structure. So what has it done? It's put a suppression on the possibility that America was. It's put a damp, a lid on that creative potentiality that every new generation brings. In your personal use of money, look on all you have or get or bring as the mothers. Make no, deba no demand, but accept what you receive from her and use it for the purposes for which it is given to you. Be entirely selfless, entirely scrupulous, exact, careful in detail, a good trustee. Always consider that it is her possessions and not your own that you are handling. On the other hand, what you receive for her lay religiously before her. Turn nothing to your own or anybody else's purpose. This ability to recognize the purity of the money that is given from that place, to be able to recognize the power of the money that is given from that alignment with the divine manifestation, I began to discover when I worked for my teacher. He basically put me at one point in charge of all the finances. So what happened is I became aware of what money that was coming in that was a donation and w money that was coming in with conditions. And the, he had me separate out the two. That money that came with conditions could be used for some things, but money that came from donations had to be exclusively for the divine work. So it was a great sharing because I began to experience the difference between the money that was given with conditions and the money that was given freely. I knew it in myself. I knew that the money that I had given was given freely. The nature of what it had is that the little bit of money that was given freely had an enormous effect 
in, in manifesting his work. It was incredibly efficient in being able to bring forward his his work into the world. I remember when we he wanted to do the six month Gita advanced course. <laughs> And my job was first to come up with a budget of what it would cost, and then just do everything. Send out the notices, get collect the money, organize the structure of the program. I flew to the United States, and I we picked up a location. And it had a limit, I can't remember, I think it was $12,000. That was the budget. Mm. And it was very, screw, I mean, very tight. I mean, India is much poorer than here, so, you know, we had that. We had to look at what we could translate, what we could do in India versus what we could do in the United States. So everything had to be supported through offerings and other people giving us places or giving us funds in order for this to happen. And the thing was, it was quite chaotic. It was very intense. I did everything that I could to try to conserve the expenditure, to use the money well, to use the money efficiently. <clears throat> So, it, but at one point, things were out of my control. My, the teacher decided that the house we were using wasn't enough, so he went out and rented three apartments. <laughs> and he decided that the places we were, the place we were meeting in, was not big enough, and so we had to go out and rent three different places to travel every time we did a course every single weekend. So, you know, I did everything I could to manage it, and then Ma, his companion, had what appeared to be a heart attack. And they took her to the most expensive heart trauma clinic in Los Angeles. And the bill came in, and it was like $6,000. Ended up to be nothing, just energy. <laughs> and it would look like it was going to be the budget break. That was half our budget right there. It would have gone right out the door. So we went in there, and we just said, this woman is from India. She doesn't know anything. They have no money. They're only here for a short period. And they got it down to $3,000. So we settled for $3,000. They went back to India. When all was said and done and everything was tallied up, <coughs> we made $50. <laughs> it was the money, it was the scrupulousness. It was the attention to detail. Every single receipt I was tracking, every single expenditure I was looking at a way in order to make it manageable so that it would be no more than what we needed. It was like a, we were trying to create this out of nothing within that paradigm of the $12,500 budget. And that is exactly what happened. Bing. So the money power was perfectly utilized. It manifested one of his most powerful courses, the, the uh, advanced Gita course, which is all recorded. And it's all it's a package which he's been able to sell and help support his work from that point. So how to be conscious, scrupulous, a good trustee, the quality of the integrity and the attention to detail. This is the nature of what the mother book is pointing to. It's not about scrimping and saving alone, because once Kabera force flows, then actually it becomes abundant. Things start coming that are abundant, and there is nothing to be repulsed in that abundance. But it doesn't make any difference. You know, I drove up to see George yesterday on his birthday, my brother, and as I was driving away in Satyapriti Saturn, he says, well, as long as you, I know you, that is your car, then I know you're not in it for the money. <laughs> oh, Her 1998 Saturn. <clears throat> the one they don't make parts But it makes for. no difference. I love the car because it's so efficient. I, you know, you're going to have to pull it away from my cold, dead hands before I'm going to let it go. <laughs> it's the right attitude. You know, all the work that I do. If it, Social Security is my main source of income, $960 a month. You, those of you who are giving me donations, I, I divert, I've been diverting them to, to New Dharma, but I am taking some of them now. I bought myself a new computer. Things like this. <laughs> <clears throat> but there is nothing in me that needs more. I don't know, if people started giving me as much money as they give to New Dharma, I wouldn't know how to handle it. I wouldn't know what to do with it. That's why I give it to New Dharma. Because it's designed to convert it into a manifesting instrument. 
And Satchamaya is the perfect one for doing that. This is her gift, her skill. Has always been able to make money for others. Not for herself. She spends all her money so that she can make this money for New Dharma. She supports any money she has. She supports herself so she's not a burden on New Dharma. She's been doing all the programs in New Dharma, paying for all the programs, paying for her airfare until she ran out of money last year. She never says anything. She probably doesn't even like me saying anything about mm-hmm. it now. No, I don't. <laughs> but you did. But the idea of the scrupulousness and the integrity needed for the manifestation is what I learned through Sri and the mother and the grace of my teacher to show me exactly what that looked like. You know, I can't tell you how free I feel now that money no longer is the factor in my life. I am free to be. I can serve the world without needing anything from the world. My basic needs are met so much so that I'm saving more money than I ever saved when I made ten times more (laughs) per month. It's like the fish and uh, the the basket with the fish and bread. You know, Christ kept giving me. There was always more. So as much, I just gave away a thousand dollars to someone. You know, it's just no matter what I give away, there's still more in there. (coughs) It's just the nature of the right attitude when you're no longer hoarding it for yourself. When you let go of the fear and you just have faith and you do what is in there in your heart to do in the world, to serve the world, to contribute to the world with every talent, capacity, strength that you have, then the money force is yours. It comes to you. Do not look up to men because of their riches, or allow yourself to be impressed by the show, the power, or the influence. When you ask for the mother, you must feel that it is she who is demanding through you a very little of what belongs to her, and the man from whom you ask will be judged by his response. If you are free from the money taint, but without any ascetic withdrawal, you will have a great power to command the money for the divine work. Equality of mind, absence of demand, and the full dedication of all you possess and receive, and all your power of acquisition to the divine Shakti and her work, are the signs of this freedom. Any perturbation of mind with regards to money and its use, any claim, any grudging, is a sure index of some imperfection or bondage. Now, sure, what Sri Aurobindo and the mother created was on a shoestring. They, 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 they make, you know, this, the scrupulousness was out of necessity. There was, they, was, they were very, very poor. And when they decided to do this work, they literally had to, the way they mobilized it, is they required that everyone who came to them gave them all their wealth, whatever wealth they had. They literally took it. And they, they weren't an organization. The two of them, the money was in either her name or his name. And they used that money to build the ashram. They used they they cre- and everyone who came they took on the burden of supporting. They provided all their material needs. They provided them with work. They took care of their health, all the rest of it. So they converted the money, the individual wealth of the first thirty people, the first hundred people, the two hundred people, and they used it to create a structure that would allow my people to go beyond the money tank. So that they labored, they worked. The mother didn't have a meditation hall. They didn't have chantings and rituals and practices. They had work. That's all they had, work. So they used this to create a structure by which Shuera Bindo could bring together people of a wide variety of capacities. Some were barely spiritual. Some were very spiritual. Some were incompetent, some were competent, some had personality disorders, some were in harmony with everyone. They brought all kinds, consciously, they brought all kinds of people together who had any opening at all to the force that they were bringing in. And they did this by creating this structure, this self-sustaining structure, 
that would allow for this work to manifest. And as the, there would be periods of time where there would be a sudden surge, there was always, Mother would not hesitate to ask, even demand, from people who would come to her in to worship her or to give acknowledge to her for whatever money resources they have. They, so she would say, I, we are building this. We need this much money. You need to give what you can for us to do this. She was not, she would not hesitate to ask anybody who had all kinds of power and prestige. She was, they were all equal in her life. She would not hesitate to, to demand from them to give a portion of whatever money power they had to serve her work. She was guileless, direct, free, and they couldn't help but give to her. They couldn't not give to her. It was this irresistible quality of her freedom from the money paint that had her able to manifest. Look at the Auroville. I mean, literally, it just was created out of nothing, and that dome is gold gilded. <laughs> It was just a sign of the perfection possible, a sign of the evidence of this creating a new physical reality in which the supermental could manifest, or the possibility of it could manifest. So this capacity to mobilize the money power, this is the, this is a dynamics. You know, I remember that for me when I even ran my business, I never made much money. I would have made as much money working for someone with none of the stress <laughs> when I ran a half a million dollar a year architectural business. <clears throat> and the, there was this every two weeks I had payroll, $25,000 every two weeks. Back in 1985, that was a lot of money. <clears throat> and I, wouldn't, I had no resources. Everything was hand to mouth. I get paid, it gets spent. And everything was used to keep building the business. So the people, the paying the payroll, there was just, this is what we had to do. So I would have to go out and start beating the bushes. I would say, okay, I know it's only been two weeks, but I need the money now. <laughs> you know? And I know I did this two weeks ago, but now I need it again. <laughs> and they just got used to it. I got beyond my shyness, beyond my hesitancy, because the demand, the necessity of it was there. And then I would talk to one person and they wouldn't do it, but the money would come from someplace else. Someone else would pay up that I'd given up on. It was a remarkable how it manifested for years. This is how it worked. It wasn't until the bank gave me a credit line that it started falling apart. Because I was no longer in touch with the demand. It wasn't so edgy. And then I got sloppy. And then you lost interest. And I also, also. lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> It just wasn't, I couldn't, I couldn't work that hard for something that served my ego. It just wasn't satisfying me. If I wasn't serving the client, if I wasn't serving the people who worked for me, then I didn't have any reason to do this. It wasn't about my fame or success or any of that. That was entertaining, that was enjoyable, but it wasn't was what was motivating me. The ideal sadhaka in this kind is one who is required to live poorly, can so live, and no sense of want will affect him or interfere with the full interplay of the divine consciousness. And if he is required to live richly, can so live, and never for a moment fall into desire or attachment to his wealth or to the things that he uses, or servitude to self-indulgence, or a weak bondage to the habits that the possession of riches creates. The divine will is all for him and the divine Ananda. When we surrender our will to divine's will, the money power is just one force that becomes available to you. Because through your surrender to the divine's will, the divine will is always to manifest more and more perfectly the expressions of Satchitananda into existence. So this ability to mobilize the money power is simply to ask. It's not anything you do. It comes because you are surrendered 
And it's divine through you that asks. And you honor that. You stand up for that. You don't mistakenly think it's about you. This then gives you the capacity to convert the money power into an opportunity for manifesting a physical reality that gives the structure by which divine can manifest more and more perfectly. There is no error in beauty or in harmony or in the, and the quality of life that can occur when there is sufficient wealth. It's only in our own ego that we would distort that. There's nothing greater than a, a physical demonstration of divine manifestation. It becomes a temple. When you go out on the property and you labor to clean the property or to cut the trees or when you paint something or fix something or, or clean the rug, you're supporting the perfection of that divine manifestation through your labor, through your sacrifice, through your effort. It's coming, ideally, out of surrendering your will to divine's will, surrendering what you would rather do to the necessity that's before you to be done. And if you're in touch with that, it's a delightful self-expression. It's all you want to do. It's totally play. It was what was there inherently that was there in the original intent for the human being in this world. It wasn't about austerity or suffering or sacrifice. It was the to be able to enjoy the light, the riches of the physical and vital world without attachment, without clinging, without control, to be in each moment of it. In the supermental creation, the money force has to be restored to the divine power and used for a true and beautiful and harmonious equipment and ordering of a new divinized vital and physical existence in whatever way the Divine Mother herself decides in her creative vision. But first it must be conquered back for her, and those will be strongest for the conquest who are in this part of their nature strong and large and free from ego and surrendered without any claim or withholding or hesitation, pure and powerful channels for the supreme puissance. When an opportunity comes for divine manifestation, when something true, integritous, something real comes into existence, then there can be no greater hmm, direction to apply your effort, your resources, your talents than to that manifestation. This was completely clear to me when I went to India. When all that's when I began to tap into that current of service, that current of seva, that it was far exceeded all the bliss, all the ecstasies that I was experiencing in my meditations. It was a thrilling manifesting force that when I was serving that took me beyond my ordinary human capacities, talents, to manifest in the world. So money is one of the measures that determines our effectiveness in this dimension. It's one of the things that will allow a possibility to actualize in this dimension. In order to create what's next, we have to have this money power accessible. The residential program, for example, it requires an infrastructure. It requires much more physicality than anything I have done previously. To bring that into existence means a physical container can be created for this energy that I am bringing in, that we're all bringing in, that is a continuation of the work of Shura Bindu and the Mother. And that it would leave a legacy it will leave a history that will be able to go on beyond the time that I'll be on this planet to continue to serve the structure of this manifestation. 
you know, it's much easier just to travel to different locations and do a program and then go back home and rest, you know, just to do it over here and talk to some people about awakening or talk to someone about how to process their issue and then go home and just collect the money, you know, and people are so grateful and they give the notions. And then just hang out in the little house you have and rest for the next time. It's much different than when you move into what it is you're creating. You're living in the midst of the cauldron of what it is you're pointing to in order to create an intensification of the process of otherwise life could take lifetimes to bring forward. So this is what's happening. It's such a wonder. Now I'm an architect, right? So I, I worked with developers. I did a lot of projects that brought physical manifestation. So I'm sure the divine said, okay, let's use that one. He knows how to mobilize resources. He knows how to make it happen. He knows how to build a foundation and framing and bring the people in and get the communications and create the structure. So that's why divine chose this form. It was for this purpose this house and the other houses and the, not just this reaching outward that's definitely a very important part but this is the base this will be the foundation of the manifestation into the physical dimension of this force of consciousness to imbue itself into these places into these, la this, these lands so that a new paradigm for living can manifest it's got a spot on this planet, a tiny little fraction of the whole planet. But the, effect, the effectiveness of this force that's occurring here will affect the whole planet. Just like they converted the entire town of Pondicherry into their ashram. Well, we're converting shh, the entire <laughs> valley of Washoe Valley. <laughs> into my ashram, into this ashram, <coughs> into this opportunity for physical manifestation. <laughs> right in the midst of the cowboys and the and horse people and the, and the retirees and the cranky old men and the fearful people and the dysfunctional families and the alcoholism and right in the middle of it we're creating this perfect new divine possibility. Okay. So good? There you are. So now let's finish with the meditation. Let us meditate. 